Only for a little while. All right, there we are. Stand with me. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. You may be seated. I thought I'd change it up a little bit this morning. I'm um, quite fascinated with the U.S. election, so I was wanting to um, speak on something really light and see how the U.S. election with Trump and Hillary, um, how that fits into our um, uh, end times belief. And <laughs> let's turn to Revelation. I'm equally as horrified and entertained with what's happening down in the States. Oh, I don't know. If, <laughs> if I was an American, my, I have a lot of American um, relatives. My sister lives in Dallas and such, and, it's, and, and a lot of other relatives and friends that are down in the States. And the varying viewpoints on their political beliefs is staggeringly different on other side of, you know, and, and I just, you know, all we're told to do is pray for the leaders. And uh, I tell you right now, um, the Americans and U.S. need prayer as they're going through this thing. But we're not going to be going there in my sermon at all, even though I love end times teaching <laughs> and how Israel will fit into that and Armageddon and all sorts of things. But we'll lighten it up this morning. My topic for you this morning is, are, am I okay down here? Are you fine with me seeing here? All right. I could sit right in the middle. We can all circle, stare at each other as well. Um, uh, my, my family, um, not my, my family with my, my boys and daughters-in-laws and grandchildren, but my family, the Preston Cole family. Um, uh, my dad was a pastor. My mom, my, my, mom my, my blood mom, my birth mom left my dad when I was around three years old. My dad was a pastor. My mom's husband um, passed away in a, in a work accident. So we had two families, uh, my dad and, and my sister and I, and my mom, my, my stepmom, had four children and brought these two families together um, back when I was, like I said, four years old. So I go, I come into this family of four other children but my family, all six of them, the, the mom and dad and, and the, the six kids, four, how many kids are in our family? Six kids, eight people in the family. <laughs> Mathematics isn't being, being a real strong suit for me. Um, they were extremely talented. My, my family can sing. They, they lead worship. My, my brother's still a worship leader. In Calgary, he's done several CDs. My other brother, Sean, has done CDs. Uh, uh, play, they play every instrument. I'm, I don't think there's, there's an instrument my, my brother, Mark, uh, doesn't play. Um, the only ones that uh, can't really lead worship or sing very well, even though I try, is my dad and I. But every other person in the family are phenomenal musicians and singers and worship leaders. And, uh, and I, I remember when I was uh, elementary school, and I was able to pick an instrument that I wanted to play. And, um, oh, do you like my preaching shoes, Mickey Mouse preaching shoes? I decided that every time I preach, I'm going to wear my Mickey Mouse preaching shoes. Um, that has nothing to do with my sermon, but. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I'm goofy. Um, but uh, my, my parents asked me what, what instrument that, did I want to play when I was like uh, t 9 or 10 or something like that. And I said, well, I want to play the banjo. And they were like, where did that come from? Like a banjo? And that was like, no, you're not playing a banjo. You're going to be playing a tuba, you know. And... Uh, and a tuba is not a very classy instrument because usually it's at the back 
up behind everybody else, and all you're doing is boom, 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 you know, that sort of thing. So I, I progressed from the tuba to a baritone, which is a euphonium, to um, a trombone. I don't know if you know that, but I do play a trombone. I still have a trombone in my basement, and Alicia and I, one of these days, are going to be playing a song for you on the trombone, because <laughs> you're a trombonist as well. And uh, so uh, I, I remember that, what a, what a funny thing, like all my family was at the front whenever we did, like this was back in the old Pentecostal times where my family would travel, and um, they would travel, and we would do, um, wor- we would do worship things and stuff, in, in, uh, and, you know, evangelistic meetings and stuff, and my whole family would do that, we'd, we'd go out and and travel to um, Indian reserves and other places, other churches, and we would put on a show, my whole family. And here my, my families were playing the saxophone and, and singing and worshiping and, and all of this stuff, and I'd be at the back, dum, 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 you know, like at the back. So I had this real, I've always desired to be in the front. I always wanted to at least, let me put my tuba baritone at the front, in front of my whole family, um, but uh, I, I never was able to do that. But I always had, um, my, because my family was so talented and I wasn't musically, um, I tried to find an outlet for my, my, um, uh, my misbehavior, let's say, in, in not a positive way. So I ended up uh, becoming sort of like the class clown, which is very surprising. I know you probably think that's, oh, really? Seriously, you did? Yeah, no, I was a class clown. And, and I would do anything. I was forever being pulled into the principal's office and, and so on. And, and being, um, I, I was even my, my uh, a gentleman that I work with right now, my best friend Peter, when we were growing up, him and I ended up getting arrested and taken to jail and, you know, and then brought to high school and, you know, in handcuffs and stuff like that. And we didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> it wasn't our fault. <laughs> but we are forever being, when we got older, uh, my, uh, we were forever being bailed out of jail and stuff. My sister would have to come and get us out of jail and so on. But I found my outlet for who I was, what I was, in doing bad things. And, and um, one of the other things that I really found a, an outlet in was, or for someone to notice in me was, was my pugilistic expertise. I, I could fight. And I would be boxing and, and different things like that. And I found the very first time I ever got into a fight, I found that people noticed me. And of course, when you're a character like me, always striving to move from the back to the front, someone noticing you is, is what you were aiming for. And I lost who I was. Because that, that's not what I was. That's not who I was. That's what I did. That's how I got people to notice me. But that's not truly who I was. And, and I came from a church, um, not the church my dad pastored, but the church in, in Vancouver. And... We had a very hierarchical, strong leadership, top-down kind of leadership. And um, we did what the pastor said. We were at church, um, you know, at least three or four days a week. And you had to be at clubs and choir practice. And you had to go to do street ministry. And you had to be in the in the first service on Sunday, and then there's a Friday night service, and then, of course, there's an evangelistic service on Sunday night, and then we would have Wells of Joy, which would be the youth service on Sunday afternoon. We were forever in church, and stuff, very hierarchical, top-down, do-what-I-say kind of uh, mentality, and that's the church culture that I, that I was raised in, and, uh, and I, I remember a number of times going to church and... Uh, and, and such, and we would be told, if you want to have someone come to the Lord, if you want to um, have a friend to know Jesus, bring him to church. Uh, you, you had someone that needed to be saved, 
well, bring them uh, to church on Sunday night because we're going to have an evangelist. Or if, you, if there's somebody that needs healing, bring them on a Sunday morning because we're going to pray for the sick on Sunday morning. Uh, if you have someone that is demon-possessed, bring them to church. We'll have the elders lay hands on them, et cetera. So everything was um, centered in the church. Very, All of our needs will be met inside the church. Very few times was I ever encouraged to actually take my Christianity outside. No, you don't lead someone to the Lord in your community. God forbid that you lay your hands on somebody in the workplace. Bring them to church. This is where we're going to be. And so I lost who I was as a Christian. I had no idea what I was supposed to do. And because we were all told to bring all your needs, et cetera, into church. And very few times did church ever get outside the front doors, if you know what I mean. Because we were always inside the front door, let alone outside. We were there. And going to church um, was like our respite, coming back and bringing people to church so they can be... Anybody ever was raised in that kind of culture? Um, and I was, and I, and I fought against that, and I ran away from that. And, and when I went to um, Regent College after I sort of got my life straight, thank you to this beautiful woman right here, Jennifer, when, when, when she came into my life, I was a mess, and, and her, her brothers hated me, and they just hated it. I was, I was working down at the rail yards and stuff. I was in, like working down with the longshoremen. I'd come... I. I'd have a motorcycle, I'd ride my motorcycle up on the front yard. And I had a big belt buckle, cowboy boots and stuff like that, kick the door down. Where's that woman? You know, not that bad, you know. <laughs> but her dad was a police off, ex-police officer, and he wanted to he wanted to shoot me. And and they would forever come to her and say, What do you see in this man? What what do you, what is with him? And and I honestly, I don't know how she what she saw in me, maybe I was a lot better looking than I am now, or something. Um, but her, I mean, I was, I was rough. I was rough. And she came into my life. And you have to understand, I was, I was a PK. When I was born, my dad was a pastor. The church out at Living Waters, it's called now, um, out in White Rock, uh, no, uh, Fort Langley, the basement of the church was our home. So I wasn't this person that was raised outside of, outside of Christian. I was raised in the, uh, literally, in the church. My bedroom was in the church and such. But when she came into my life, things changed. And I remember um, after a number of years being in the ministry, um, full-time in ministry, I decided, you know, what I need to do is I need to get more education. I went out to Regent College out uh, UBC. And there was a, a professor of mine named Paul Stevens. I'm going to re, read this next slide, please. Do we have it? This is in one of um, um, Paul Stevens' books. On, it's called Equipper's Guide to Every Member Ministry. And this changed my life. But have you forgotten who you are? You are a minister of Jesus Christ, a holy priest, an ambassador for Christ, an agent of reconciliation in the world, salt and light and yeast. You cannot, you cannot assist your pastor. His job is to assist you in your ministry. Now, Paul Stevens' whole theology of ministry was not to raise up Christians and people in the church. And we're talking a uh, post graduate degree course, a master's degree course, to, to work in the church. His philosophy was to raise up leaders within the church and get, get them equipped to take the ministry and take it out, to take it outside of these walls, which was a theology and, and a way of thinking that I was, it was foreign to me. I was, wait a second, aren't we supposed to bring all the needs, everything, into the church to let the professionals, the pastors, the ministers, the, the prophets and stuff, to do with them what they need to do? And Paul Stevens just blew my mind. 
And when I, when I finished my thesis, Paul Stevens was one of the professors that was standing with me as I was writing the thesis. Have you forgotten who you are? You are a minister of Jesus Christ, a holy priest, an ambassador for Christ, an agent of reconciliation in the world, salt and light and yeast. You cannot assist your pastor. His, oh, go back. Trigger happy. His job is to assist you in your ministry. And the very first um, sermon I ever preached here over just about nine years ago, now you can go to the next one, was is in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, their job was not to do the work of the ministry. Understand this. Their job was not to have people bring people into the church so the pastors and the prophets and the evangelists can do the work. Our job as pastors, our job as leaders within the church is to equip you to do the work of the ministry in the world. Think about the the cultural shift that that has to to take place where, well, you know, we did our good. We, We brought this person into church and the pastor couldn't help them. Well, what did you do? How did you pray for them? How did you go outside of your comfort zone to touch the people that needs to be touched? I live with this every day because I'm not an on-staff pastor. I'm not a full-time minister, but what I am is I'm a minister in the marketplace. I'm a pastor in my, my, my company name that I had when I was in the renovation uh, business was Rev Kev the Handyman. It was who I was. I was the handyman. I was in construction. I did that, but who I was was Rev Kev. I was a pastor inside of the workplace. Our job as pastors and teachers is to equip you to take the gospel and to go and do it inside the marketplace. But did you notice that when Jesus was selecting the 12, his 12 disciples, he never selected a pastor or a church leader? He selected ordinary people like you and I. Jesus actually called the spiritual leaders of the day a brood of vipers. He never took somebody that was theologically trained. He never used anybody that had education behind them, that worked in the church, that was a pastor in the church. Jesus only selected people like you to follow him. I'll make you fishers of men. He, he would, you know, we're driving by, and Jennifer and I, every time we come around the corner on 108th Avenue and King George Highway, there's a gospel mission there. And there's people outside laying on their, that's their home, is laying on the street. And, and I see it every, ta- every day I go to work and back and such. And, and I was thinking about Jesus, and I'm going, you know, that's where he would be on a Sunday morning. That's where he would hang out. He, he wouldn't be here. He would be there. He would be with the prostitutes. He would be with the drug addicted. And, and I'm going... Well, what are we supposed to do about that? How are we supposed to fit our Christianity into a Jesus theology? It, it, it just blows me away. Well, I'm, not, I, I'm not equipped. I'm not equipped to deal with that. But where God has me, where I'm not called to do that, but I'm called to be a minister in my marketplace. I'm I'm called to be a pastor where I work. I'm called to be a minister where I am. And and that's for you. If you're called, if if that's your ministry, if that's what God wants for you, then that's where you should be. But wherever God has you, that's where you're supposed to be. Well, God hasn't called me here or called me there, but where has God called you? Well, I don't know where God's called. Where are you right now? Well, I'm working at A&W, then God's called you to A&W. Where, what about this and what about that? Well, where has God called you? Where are you 
right now. Well, I'm just in transition. Well, that's where God has called you. In that transitional space right there, right now. Let me emphasize this point. You were all called to do his work. You were all called to be his hands. The, this revelation, this whole thing changed my mind. I went from doing the work, which is this stuff, to actually empowering people to do the work of the ministry because that's what I'm called to do. And if you can leave here today with a sense of purpose, a sense of, okay, I've got to look. See, we've got to look outside of our comfort zone because sometimes we get real comfortable where we are. I'm, I'm comfortable right here. I need, and this morning was, I tell you, it was a, you're, you're out in the battle you're, you're out fighting the good fight. You're out, you're encountering things that are demonic. You're out encountering things that are not of God. There are people that are demon-possessed that you're encountering every day. I, I, I went by, um, we were down at uh, Cloverdale um, uh, uh, Market, Street Market yesterday, Jen and I, and the boys, and there was this uh, witch that was um, selling her wares on the sidewalk. And I purposely walked by. Every time I walked by him, I started praying in tongues. I'm, I'm like, and, and we were at, um, uh, in Seattle, we were at, no, Portland, at the big bookstore. Powell's book. We went to Powell's book, and I went into the spiritualistic section where they have all of the different cults. And I was literally walking up and down the aisle praying in tongues. And I, was, I, was, I knew that there was demons there, but I knew the angels with me were bigger than those demons. I just wanted to mess with them. I wasn't looking at a book. I wasn't looking for something to read, but I was just messing with the demons. Like, you want to you go, demons? Yeah, take my angels, right? But I'm called. That's what our calling is. Our calling is to, to make a difference in the world that you live in. We're not called... Uh, to do anything but do the work. I went, went the, my, my theology went from a top-down theology, this hierarchical kind of do-as-I-say kind of thing, to empowering people to do the work of the ministry. But when did this happen? Because we see in the, in the Old Testament that we see that the people were always looking for someone to lead them. There's all, the, the Old Testament people are always looking for the prophet. They were always following, you know, someone, Moses, Noah, this, all of these prophets, Jacob, Joseph, all of these people, the children of Israel were looking. We need somebody. There's Saul, there's, there's David. All of these people they're looking for. But what changed? Jesus changed it. He came in. Instead of being this top-down person, he's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. You, you watch me, and then you do it. See, that's what frustrated Jesus when Jesus went to pray for the little boy, and he was demon-possessed. And the disciples uh, couldn't deliver the little boy. And, and, Jesus was, and they, brought, they brought this little boy to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, we can't deliver him. He's got a demon. It's too big for us. And what did Jesus do? Oh, how long am I going to be with you? How long? Am I going to stand here with you and train you? This Greater is he that's in the world. But, but I need to do this. And what did he say? He says, oh, you, you, you can't bring him out because of lack of faith. Now, Jesus only had a little while to be with the disciples. But he was training them. Instead of this top-down hierarchical wandering around, who do we follow, Old Testament God, Jesus became personal for us, and he changed it. He changed it. The pivotal point, he changed everything. And Jesus himself came down and was amongst us to show us what needed to be done. Hanging out with the drug addicts, hanging out with the prostitutes, hanging out down at the construction site. That's what Jesus is. But Stephen, the first martyr, Stephen is first mentioned in Acts of the Apostles as one of the second, uh, seven deacons appointed uh, by the apostles. Stephen was, was selected to distribute food, and I'm going to read this, distribute food and charitable aid to poor members of the community and the church. He was also a fantastic preacher who died defending the faith. Now, when Jesus came, 
and he left. He left a remnant of followers of, of Jesus. But what happened was, is that there was pre persecution that came into church. And Stephen ended up being the first martyr. And what happened was, is that the gospel from Stephen on was, was dispersed. And I'm going to read this. And we don't have this up here, but it's in Acts 8, 1 to 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen. Now Stephen was preaching. He got killed. They buried him. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Verse 4, those who had been scattered, listen to this. Those, this is after Jesus died. This is the first martyr, Stephen died. Persecution came to the church. They buried Stephen and they came together and... Philip went down when uh, those who had been scattered preached the gospel, preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to uh, a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah. They, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was great joy in the city. So what happened was, is Jesus was here. He got crucified. He went to be with heaven. He left a remnant of people with him, with here on earth to take the gospel, the apostles and such. They bring Stephen in. Stephen gets martyred and a great persecution led by Saul. Great persecution came into the church and what did the people do? They scattered. They ran for their lives. Now these people were bakers. They were stay-at-home moms, they were bankers, they were warehousemen, women, they were candlestick makers, they were police officers, they were cabinet installers, they were cabinet builders, they were um, all sorts of different people. But these people, ordinary people, people like you and I, people like us here this morning, we took the gospel, the diaspora Jews they called it, and we dispersed with the gospel. And what happened? As they ran for their lives, they were preaching the gospel. As they ran for the lives, they said, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close, uh, close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. These were the things that were happening to the diaspora Jews that left because of persecution. They ran preaching the gospel. They ran laying their hands on people. They had Jesus Christ inside of them. And what did they go with? Did they go with the Bible? They didn't have the Bible at that time. They didn't have the New Testament. They were living the New Testament. But what they had was they had stories of Jesus. They had stories that they heard. Some of these people didn't have never even met, physically met Jesus. But what they heard and what they saw and what they heard preached, they had in their heart. And they took. That's you and I. They were you and I. This dispersed Jews were ordinary Christians running for their lives into a new community, preaching the gospel, laying hands on the sick, seeing them recovered, having people come to know Jesus as their personal Savior, not because of what they saw in the Bible, because of the stories that they heard and the things they saw. And people saw this. People came to know the Lord because of the miracles. How did that happen? Well, I'll tell you what. I heard a story of a man. His name was Jesus. He came and he died for us. See, this happened. This man died for our sins, and now I am a minister of Jesus Christ. I am a person that can take the gospel and lay my hands on the sick. I'm a candlestick maker, and I'm running with the glory of Jesus. Running for my life, yes. Moving out of your home, yes. But taking the gospel with them, yes. Amen? That's us. What was that? I think I need a drink. That's us, people. That's who we are. That's what we do. We're taking the gospel into the community that we live in. Um, it, it's a powerful thing. Now, we only have a couple of minutes. 
And I asked for a handout, and I would have loved to give it to you, but I don't have the handout with you. But um, if you're jotting notes, write them down. But I want to go over this quickly with you. I want to leave you with this. And we have 10 minutes. I think I can get through this within five minutes. I want to leave you with this. Who are you? I want to go into scripture. Uh, my boys, my, my boys would um, say to me when they were younger, Dad, can you do this? Or Dad, can you do that? And, and I remember we were on a, a mo we rented a motor home and we went on a motor home trip and um, my four boys uh, wanted me to draw a cartoon character. And I said, I'm not an artist. Like, I can't um, draw a cartoon character. I don't know how to draw a cartoon character. And one of the boys said to me, he says, Dad, do you remember what Philippians 4.13 says? One of my young boys. I'm going, Philippians 4.13, I'm being preached at by my child. And, and it says, what does Philippians 4.13 I say it a little louder. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and that became our family verse. Uh, yesterday or Saturdays is a day when Jennifer and I are able to go to the gym together. And uh, we try to go to the gym, but because of our schedule during the week, Saturdays is, is a day that we can go. And it's chest day for us, um, which means uh, <laughs> my... my means something different to you, but for me, it means that we're actually going to, we're going to um, uh, weight lift and do exercises that would strengthen our chest. And um, I'm still uh, trying to lift heavier and heavier, even though I'm getting older and older. And I'm still trying to hang on to that strength that I had, and it's quickly fading uh, from me at 56 years of old. And, and so I'm sitting there with this weight um, in my hands, and Jennifer spotted me. Now, Jennifer is not um, the strongest person in the world, and so if I'm... Well, that's my second glass of water. Thank you. Oh, it's cold, too. I was sitting under the weight yesterday, and I had 285 pounds on the bench, and I had the, I had the weight, and she's standing over me, and I know if, if I drop that weight on my chest, she's not going to be able to help me. So the first scripture that comes into my head is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and then I'm able to do it. It's, it's amazing how when my children 20-something years ago said a verse, it became my family verse, that that still is in me when I try to do something that is way over my head. And it still comes into my mind, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I stand on that verse. I, every, everything that I encounter that I don't think I can do, I think of Philippians 4.13. But let me, let me go over quickly with this. Colossians 2.10. I am complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. I am complete in him who is the head of... This is all scripture here. I am alive with Christ, Ephesians 2, 5. I am free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2. I have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. I have the greater one living in, he, in me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world, 1 John 4, 4. This, this is all things that you are. Who are you? This is who you are. This is what you are. Well, how do I know that? Because the Bible says it. I, I, I just, I, I want you to have some kind of, of focus about what, not, not what the perp, your purpose is in life, but who you are in Christ. Who are you in Christ? What are you called to do in Christ? And these scriptures, I am complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. I'm complete in Jesus Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. I am complete in him. I have nothing more to gain. I am complete. As soon as I ask Jesus into my life, and I say, Lord, come into my life, I am complete in him. 
Just think about what that says, but quickly. I have the greater one living in me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I have no lack for my God. I have no lack for my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I have no lack for my supplies all of my need according to his riches and glory. Philippians 4.19. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. I am God's workmanship, created in Christ unto good works. Ephesians 2.10. I am a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'm a believer and the light of the gospel shines in my mind. 2 Corinthians 4.14. I'm a doer of the word and blessed in my actions. James 1.22. I am joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 17. I am more than a conqueror through him who lives in sin, who loves me. Romans 8, 31. Amen? Are, are you getting a hold of who you are in Jesus Christ? I'm amb- I am an ambassador for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. I'm part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people. people. 1 Peter 2, 19. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am not my own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. Deuteronomy 28, 13. I am forgiven of all my sins and washed in the blood. Ephesians 1, 7. I am delivered from the power of darkness and translated in God's kingdom. Colossians 1, 13. I am redeemed from the curse of sin, sickness, and poverty. Deuteronomy 28. I am called of God to be the voice of his praise in Psalm 66, 8. I am healed by the street stripes of Jesus, 1 Peter 2, 24. I am greatly loved by God, Romans 7, 1, 7. And it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2, 20. Amen? Amen. Just think about who you are in Jesus Christ. It's amazing. I, it is not I who live, but it's Christ living in me. When I, when I pray for somebody, it's not me. It's God praying through me. My encouragement and my benediction this morning for you is that you be God's hands extended, that you be his eyes, that you be his ears, you, you be his mouth, you be his voice. Because the only Jesus that people are going to see in this world is a Jesus that lives inside of you. Amen? It's not me living. It's Christ living in me. There has to be. Someone walked into our house one time and stopped. They said, "I I feel peace in here. I feel God's presence in here. Why? Because we prayed over the house. We asked God to come into our house. We asked God's presence to come into our house. It's not just because Jennifer and I have a nice home, which I hope we do, but it's because of the peace of Jesus lives inside of our home. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that we can come into your house. And Lord, be encouraged. My my number one goal this morning is that we would be encouraged that we would see who we are in Jesus Christ, that we would get a picture, of a, a, a sample of what it is to be in you, O oh God. Lord, sometimes uh, self-doubt and, and um, uh, our, our, our perspective of who we are gets clouded with who we truly are. And sometimes our past, even my past, gets clouded in who I am, and I forget of who you made me. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that every person would get an understanding of who they are in Jesus Christ, that we are joint heirs with you, that we can do all things with you, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. I always do this with eyes closed. If there's anybody here that has not accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, I just ask, if that's you, just raise your hand. I would love to pray with you. Amen. Stand, please. And I already shared the benediction, but I'll share it again. Go out and touch somebody's life. Be God's hands extended. Be his eyes, be his ears, and be his mouth. Amen? God bless you. Now, if you need prayer, please come down. We have some wonderful people that would like to join you in prayer. Amen.